home that I saw my mother's death there as rain falling on a railroad bridge. I was stalled ridiculous in a car between the tracks. And when I asked my father what to do next, he only said, put the four ways on so they'll see you and know you're not a fool. The bridge at that point over, I think third street, but it snakes all across downtown to the east end of childhood Dayton, the extent of which blurs or has become so exaggerated, uh, but with high cement sides all my life in whose shadow. And I'll follow that with the, with the beginning of my, my, my book, Ohio Railroads, which is uh, a poem in the form of an essay. And it was written a few, a few years ago, written and published a few years ago. Having dreamt years previously of seeing my mother's death falling indistinguishable from rain, on a railroad bridge at the eastern end of Dayton's downtown business district. I went out purposely on the day after she did die, the 3rd of August, 2008, her death having occurred on the 2nd, to see the bridge itself on East 3rd Street. It was standing as I recalled it in the dream, but I'd seen and passed under the bridge many times in my own early life in Dayton. It was the furthest edge of downtown, the obvious boundary or monument of boundary between downtown and the tough white neighborhoods beyond downtown, east of it. She, my mother, had come to Dayton in 1949 with her new husband when she was 25 from St. Louis, where she had lived with her parents, where she had taught in the public schools. She had a master's degree in education from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, from the University of Michigan in, in Ann in Ann Arbor. In Ann Arbor, she had lived in a residence hall and some of the white women there, her fellow graduate students, asked her to help them in their petition to force the handful of black students to eat together consistently, to take each meal at the same cafeteria table, not realizing that she was black. In Dayton from the 40s until the mid 70s, black people lived west of the Great Miami River, the water that forms the western limit of downtown. In 2008, the term of description, the West Side, still meant Black Dayton, though in fact, Black people in 2008 lived in all parts of Dayton except Oakwood. Third Street is the primary East-West street in Dayton. It traverses both the West Side and East Dayton, and it provides the division across the city for the North-South running streets. That is, streets that cross Third Street are designated North, North of the intersection, and South to the South, of their meeting with Third Street. When I went out to look at the railroad bridge on the day following my mother's death, East Third Street was a river of traffic and lanes of cars, trucks, and trolley, trolley buses flowed underneath and between the cement supports. The street was busy though it was a Sunday. I'd taken pains at the time I had dreamt of the bridge to write down details of what I had seen. And later I described the dream in a poem, which you just as just heard from me. Not noting that though the bridge I saw in the dream was over Third Street, the actual bridge snakes all across downtown Dayton and has high cement sides. I'm gonna read one more poem. Uh, this also early from, um, from my book here, which was published in 1994. This is also an Ohio poem and a poem about, about one of my parents and also uh, a dream poem and a poem having to do uh, with, uh, uh, with, with the speech acts. The activity, activities of, 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 and conventions of speech. I'll mention that my parents arriving in Ohio in the 1940s as they did were part of the last wave of the Great Migration. And part of this poem is going to come back later in the reading for a curtain call, so you, you'll, 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 meet, you'll meet part of it again um, as, as this, uh, this, this reading concludes this, uh, this afternoon. The poem is called This Way. <clears throat> Excuse me. This way, unevenness of the emblem, first generation, big as it is, ambiguous post-war Ohio. So many open ways across the river for the Negroes and their big cars. My father's in his Pontiac, he knew was a Pontiac. This is no story of anything but the way in and further in. Dreamed today, the car was stalled 
halfway over at Cincinnati, pointed north. I was full grown in the back seat and starting to age, almost 40 like I am today. Narrow bridge, no passing lane, but no traffic north or back south either. Big eyed blank face dash bolted to the firewall. He set the brake and got out, leaving me alone to think a while, you think a while, and went on off, leaving the radio on. I'm gonna continue um, uh, with a bit from Negro Mountain, the poetry book that I should finish this, uh, this summer. Um, my summer travel plans are canceled and that fact will help me finish the book. Very briefly, Negro Mountain is a real mountain in the Alleghenies. Uh, it's named Negro Mountain because of an 18th century incident involving the death of a black man during a skirmish between whites and Native Americans. The black man apparently was a servant uh, and he is reputed to have died so heroically that his white employer named the mountain for his color. The summit of Negro Mountain is the highest point in Pennsylvania. This is another, <clears throat> another dream poem uh, from an early section of the Negro Mountain book, The Dreams from the 1950s. I'll read this and then we're gonna take a little break. And, uh, um, and once again, a part of, of the poem is going to come back after the, uh, after the break. The first dream from Negro Mountain. Wolves came up the driveway and through the side yard of the old house. This was in kindergarten time. And I stood still, though I was frightened to be in their midst. And they took note of me, but did not bite me or threaten me. The light was light I had known by then, having seen it in the hour before a thunderstorm. Dull, bitter light, and everywhere, though without apparent source. The wolves had ragged gray pelts, bad fur, tufts of it and their hindquarters were skinny in comparison to their very big shoulders. They'd come in apparently from the street, Liscom Drive, and onto the property, which was nearly an acre and had once been a farmstead. And they parted around where I was standing. It was almost literally a wave of them, those wolves, as though they'd come up the hill from West Third Street or somehow got through the chain link fence of the VA cemetery that traced the hill up on Liscom Drive. A white friend wrote me, the human figure passes through the animal pack unharmed. And she said that she saw the dream as being not about the wolves as much as passing through adversity. This exchange decades after the dream itself, which had been a thing of moment, visual tinctured with obvious anxiety, current in my memory for that time before the year that she and I met. Make no mistake, dear and articulate friends, I knew it was an unstable moment. My thumbs were different, I'd seen, from one another. Beyond the driveway had been pear and walnut trees. One passes through a wood or a track does. A dull feeling overtakes you in the field. There had been a gate at the driveway, but only the posts remained, grown through by the hedges that stopped on either side of the entrance from the street. What do hills summarize? Origin stories? Right and left separated long before this. Bait me, love. I can pass until I speak. So Cecil, thank you so much for those uh, for those poems. It's it's really great to hear you read from the work that you're currently in, involved in uh, in finishing. So many of the poems are involved in questions of place. There's, uh, there's Dayton, there's home, there's Negro Mountain, and within those places, many, many other places. And of course, place is very connected uh, with memory. But it also all makes me think, uh, especially now, about location and dislocation, and how for so many people, uh, we have a feeling of being dislocated in place. Uh, yes. and, and even though we are in some of us, many of us are in very familiar places, we feel uh, dislocated. Have, have you been thinking, engaged in questions about place and location and dislocation as a result of this experience? Or is your work just so continuous that it just surpasses all that? Well, the only answer is, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to yes, to yes to everything. And, you know, it, uh, you know there's, a lot of, there's a lot of places in my memory, a lot of places in the journal. Uh, and, uh, 
But at the same time, there's something that's kind of interesting that's happened, which is we're supposed to be sheltering in place. But what that means is that there's, there's a bit of life in the neighborhood, a bit of life in the street that wasn't, wasn't quite there before. And people talk back and forth across the street in ways that we didn't, uh, that we didn't used to. Um, in my neighborhood, there's a fellow around the corner who comes out every Wednesday at noon in a tuxedo with a saxophone. Um, um, and his kids sit across the street. One has a saxophone, one has a clarinet, they wear pajamas. And uh, the neighborhood gathers at appropriate distance, everybody wearing masks, and, uh, and sings, uh, sings various, various songs. Uh, so I'm not sure that I'll recognize my neighbors after we take our masks off, <laughs> but, but, but that's, uh, that's been vital for, uh, you know, for, for us here, and I think for other, other neighborhoods, other, well, other locations, if you will, as, uh, as, as well. And indeed, the places that we are in have been transformed because we are doing different things. We're meeting people in different ways. We're meeting people we hadn't really known very well or very much in the past. And so it's also an opening to, to new experience. I hope you're going to read more from your current work. I am. Okay. Uh, shall I go? On? Please. Very good. Uh, this is an excerpt from, uh, from a latter section of the Negro Mountain book. Uh, it's called, um, and the latter section is, is called, it's called Notes on, on Region. And uh, I will read, I guess, the first, much of the first uh, page or two of, of, that, of, of that section. Notes on Region, uh, or Negro Mountain Wolves, Notes on Region. Wolves came, wolves came back to Negro Mountain. There was no pattern to it for either mountain or animals to occupy. It was not a story, but rather the germ of a shape, an undetectable weight. It was shapeless finally, unmeasured. It was only relayed. Negro Mountain, the summit of which is the highest point in Pennsylvania, is a default, a way, among others, to think about the Commonwealth. Perhaps the variation of wolves and other dogs is a series of false dilemmas, any speaker might stand or be placed or decry in their midst. In fact, the territories overlap. The territories are the same series, that's plural, of fields, trees, elevations, and watercourses. A coyote called prairie wolf, also a red wolf or barking dog or brush wolf is a wolf. Foxes are a different matter. Canis lycaon, the great lakes wolf, was named for the king Zeus turned into a wolf. Neighborhood dogs bark in a chain. Children know this. The red wolf of the south is smaller. One is similar to another. Word came from Negro Mountain that a lifelong resident there had surprised a wolf in her dooryard. Summer 2016. Her carpenter, she said, had also seen the wolf on a separate occasion. Not a coyote. That population has flourished in Pennsylvania since 1930, but a wolf. Talk on top of one another, you mountains. Entre chien et loup. Negro and what? Lie atop one another, anybody could say. Pennsylvania man, half jungle animal, talking. It varies. On such a mountain, a deliberate Negro man or a pensive Negro man might wish to be spirited away. Industry is a deep valley or a trough. There is a long bottom to consider, not the path of a moving figure, but the swath. Opposite deep valleys are the hills, elevations. A common enough wish is to enter such places and or climb through them. Often enough, one sees death in the market or at work in an office under fluorescent light explaining. Someone else might see death come across the summit like weather. Death is worked toward. Death is explained. Such a Negro man might wonder what he needed to know for the sake of coherence and find the qualification daunting or amusing. Among you, it could be the figure's motion between the reader and, say, the poem or the mountain at hand. Speaker, observer, Negro, poet, wolf, 
measure. All you and here is a here is a brief reading from uh, uh, from Train Music that just uh, completed collaborative uh, book project that documents the train journey as Tony mentioned that the visual artist Judith Margolis and I made a couple of years ago that was from uh, New York to um, uh, to Emeryville her images uh, my poem and this is the first image in the in the book this is a, a, a painting Let's see if I can if I can show this to you let's see can you guys see this I hope so there's a couple of couple of figures in it. It'll look better when the books uh, when the books printed. And it's uh, it seems to um, it would seem to to describe to describe both of us. It will be um, and as I as I mentioned to you as I mentioned to you before. It will uh, it will reference uh, the this way poem that I read near the near the beginning. In the earlier poem, I make reference to an old racist joke involving a black man and a uh, and a Pontiac. Uh, it's easily these days everything's findable on the internet. You can find it on Google if you just if you just Google uh, a racist joke in Pontiac. But uh, but over the years since the you know since the book was published, no one no one ever commented at least publicly on the joke's presence. Until a couple of years ago, a Berkeley graduate student, a woman of color, noted that she had had to explain it to a poetry class at another another college. What the what the poem was referring to. Anyway, it's part of the uh, what I'm calling the Colorado section of train of train music. Uh, the train from, as all of you know, certainly the train from Chicago to Emeryville is called the the California Zephyr. So this is from uh, from train from train music. Current catchers, pantographs, and I'll, I'll mention pantographs are the uh, the, the const construction on top of on top of uh, locomotives that that catch the uh, catch the electricity in the wires. Current catchers, pantographs on the arriving airport train, Denver Union Station, next track. Passengers in Denver on the platform marching, young people taking the train in tight jeans. Our check pants uncle in the dining car, cigarette face man, narcissistic, said, we like to feel him marching right and left of us. Share me, he said, because life's that way, feelings another way. To be a rider, a remora fish, as it were, and not know you're on the zephyr. That is, to be carried forward by an unseen agency. Call it Mariah. Call it what your pocket can bear. The feathers in your nest come from heaven. Well met, brothers, well met. The railroad is a shiny thing to a crow. See it a mile off, big flange wheels. Crow bar, Denver. Railroad bill, railroad bill. Never worked and never will. Shout in the white noise train. Blow the space into decoration. Maybe, as one would reply to an inquisitive mind, to an inquiry, concoction is what you rub against the skinny chest that's against your own. Money, honey, good clothes. Is this okay? Wave it around. Or be like the big black bird that ate the French fry off the white paper plate on the patio, having swooped in like a Negro eagle. Resist me, train, concocts me. Graffiti hoppers, graffiti hoppers in a field, the three tracks next to this one on which sit boxcars and tank cars, another flash of red, like a blackbird's shoulder patch as we go over a grade crossing, Colorado, past Grand Junction, past Glenwood Springs, train towns. How then will we get away? Having slept through Moffat Tunnel after meditating, after having left Denver, having tacked up the hill from that. You all call the Colorado River Moon River for the rafters practice, 
when the zephyr steams by. <clears throat> Excuse me. Two older red Cadillacs parked helm to stern. One sixties, one fifties, the latter with bulbous taillights and humped curve of the trunk. The boot, they say on the fans, and the former being, simple enough, thinned. Four bald-headed eagles across the Colorado River in trees. My colored friend in the poetry class had had to explain for the class and its teacher the joke referenced in the poem in which the perceived Cadillac was actually a Pontiac. Poem had made reference to its speaker's father's car, which he knew was a Pontiac, unlike the Negro in the joke. Not the home place. What did you come here for, people ask, between here and the deep blue sea? And, um, what I would, what I will do, what I usually do is uh, uh, when I give readings is I close, um, recently anyway, with a very, a very brief poem that's dedicated uh, to, my, uh, to my daughter. It's been a tradition. And so uh, we've got a couple of minutes. Uh, let, me, let, me, uh, let me do that. And this is an Illinois, an Illinois poem, and it's called, it's called Very Far, and it is for Madeline Giskin, who is perhaps, uh, perhaps in attendance. Coming back on 150 from the movies in Urbana, and there a healthy fox was in the high beams. A trick for the eyes how the snout and ears bobbed upward for a moment, his big head thrown back. Pale, it goes without saying, but fast. What doesn't change? What's the central disappointment? That it, meaning the long evening, was a single place, but I always see animals when I travel. Birds too, dusk to dawn, Mr. Fox is out on night patrol. There's little surprising about a location. I'd say Mr. Fox can match or resist the prairie with equal success. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Cecil, I think Madeline is actually watching and listening. Oh. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask if she would like to... Uh, unmute her microphone and say a word. I, I don't know if we can get that technology to cooperate. I see her name. I see her name. Well, while she's trying to connect, um, if she is, uh, let me say I certainly hope to take the California Zephyr someday. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous trip. I urge I've, you to take it. I've heard a lot about it. In fact, my wife has taken it twice recently. And, and I think Hi. Madeline is there. Hello. Yes, I am here. Can you hear me? I can. Oh. <laughs> so we just wanted to give you a chance to say hi uh, and say how pleased I am that a poem was uh, was read for you in your honor yes. at, the, at the end of the reading. reading. Yes, it's one of my favorites. <laughs> I was Cecil, very happy us, to hear it. Cecil, tell us um, where you would have been traveling this summer and whether you have plans to make that trip some other time. I was supposed to be giving a, a reading and a workshop at the University of Chicago, uh, which uh, I think is put off until the fall. Although they're not sure about this, about well, no one's sure about this about the fall. Uh, I was to be in residence at uh, the Vermont Art Studio as well. Um, that's not going to happen. And I had hoped to uh, take a cycling trip from uh, I, northern Washington State up to up to northern British Columbia. Uh, a trip I've made I've made uh, several times before to see. There's a, an ongoing project that I've. That's it's been something I've been I've been working at for, for a very long time, and I've, at this point I've got some friends up there as well. That sounds absolutely wonderful, and like it'll be a really a real treat. All of those things. Will you take the train to Chicago if you get that talk? Uh, not if it's during the semester. It's a little bit long to be away. Uh, it's a, it's a bit long to be away. Yeah. 
Well, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this evening for the, for the poems um, and the, the reading and your observations on, on so many things, including the current condition uh, that we're in and how you're responding to it. So thank you and thanks everyone um, who tuned in to listen and do remember this will be in the archives before long. So I'm gonna say goodbye and thanks again. Thank you everybody, thanks, thanks for listening. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.